Welcome, everybody, uh, back to the afternoon uh, session of the first day of this uh, conference. Uh, I apologize for having to go away during lunch. I had to be back at the uh, ECNU campus for a, a photograph that was being taken of all, all the uh, NYU Shanghai students and faculty and administrators, about six, 600 people somehow in one photograph. I, that's, you know, that using, using modern technology, I guess, you take a whole bunch of pictures and then they get melded together. So, uh, uh, so we're very pleased uh, for the uh, afternoon uh, mini course, uh, Professor Federico Camilla, uh, who is uh, uh, both from the uh, Free University in Amsterdam and uh, NYU's other uh, global portal campus uh, at Abu Dhabi, uh, which is, is, is now in its, the end of its fourth year. Shanghai is only at the end of its first year. Uh, and he's going to speak about uh, Brownian loops and conformal fields. Thank you. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you very much for the introduction. And thank you for the invitation. Can you hear me? it uh, works okay so yes th thanks very much for the uh, invitation it's my first time in China and I'm having a very good time uh, indeed and uh, really enjoying especially the food <laughs> uh, eating perhaps a bit too much but uh, um, so I'm very happy to be here and uh, I'll explain now I have the next about three hours what I mean by Brownian loops, and I'll say something about what I mean by conformal fields. As, as I wrote in the abstract, um, no prior knowledge of conformal field theory is required. In fact, I'm not really going to do any conformal field theory. Um, so let me start very briefly with a very short introduction before we uh, continue with the actual uh, first part of the talk of, of the lecture. So what, what I'll be talking about are random uh, objects that are called random walk loop soup and random walk uh, and Brownian loop soup. So you may you may wonder what what they are. Uh, it's not. It's kind of becoming standard terminology in uh, part of probability. But uh, what I'm talking about. Oops. Some noise. Um, so I'm, these objects are really collections of um, collections of random loops um, and everything I'll be talking about today is two-dimensional so I'll be talking about lattice models so you're you should think about uh, random walks making loops uh, on Z2 and then you take collections of those objects and run in motion uh, on the complex plane or R2 and th this will be the first part the second part, I'll be using this Brownian loop soup that I'll be introducing in the first part to build um, the new model, which I'll describe. I don't want to talk about it now. Um, so let me give you some, a little bit of motivation. There are different reasons for looking at these objects. Uh, one obvious reason is that they have very deep connections with other models of statistical mechanics that have been studied very much uh, lately. And by lately, I mean in the last well, there are actually some of these models, like, um, like the easy model, the Gaussian free field, are, I would say, old models. They are very well established. They have been studied for a long time. But there has been a kind of revival uh, in the last, I would say, 15 years or so, uh, largely due to uh, a new object that was introduced around 2000, 1999, by Ode Trump which is called the schramm lerner revolution, um, which there's a misspelling here, uh, which some of you may have, have, have heard of. I will actually not be talking about S. It's typically called SLE, uh, stochastic Levner revolution. That's, that's how Schramm called it. And then most mathematicians nowadays call it schramm lerner revolution. Uh, it will sort of be in the background in some sense, but I'll not be talking about SLE. Um, in this talk, really, in, this, in these lectures. And as I said, there's been a revival. There have been 
many uh, interesting results in the last 15 years or so. SLE was introduced by Schramm and was later developed by uh, uh, Lawler, Schramm, and Werner. Wendelin Werner got a Fields Medal in 2006 for work related to SLE and to uh, conformally invariant objects like the Brownian loop soup. The Brownian loop soup was introduced by uh, Wendelin Werner and, and uh, um, Greg Lawler, and it was studied. One of the main reasons for introducing it is the, its properties of conformal invariance and the connections with SLE, which I will mention. Um, in 2010, uh, Stas Smirnov got another Fields Medal for work related to um, scaling limits of percolation easing model. Um, so what, what is special about, so this is a conference on probability and, and uh, mathematical statistical mechanics. These are some of the central um, models that you, when one studies in statistical mechanics. And what is, happens to be very special in two dimensions is that when you take a scaling limit um, at the critical point or near the critical point, you obtain continuum objects that have a very special symmetry called conformal invariance. So they happen to be, uh, they happen to have scale invariance as a symmetry, but it's, uh, they actually have a much, um, uh, they actually have, it's not just scale invariance that they have, it's conformal invariance. And I will give you at least one version of that. Uh, in the context of the Brownian loop soup, I'll tell you what conformal invariance means more precisely. So, so these models that I'll be talking about, I think they're uh, interesting in their own right. Um, you can do nice mathematics with them. They have deep connections with other models of statistical mechanics. I'll mention some of them. But there is another reason uh, why I wanted to, I, I chose this topic, and it's because in some sense, uh, studying these models, you can already see some of the typical features of critical phenomena. Um, by that I mean um, the existence of a critical point with special properties, and the special properties are those are what I mentioned before. If you take a scaling limit, uh, I'll tell you what that is more precisely. Precisely, you get continuum objects which are conformally invariant. As you move away from the critical point, uh, you lose conformal invariance, you start to see uh, exponential decay of correlations, but you can also show that if you stay in some sense close enough to, to the critical point, you don't lose the conformal invariance uh, completely. You have something else which is sometimes called conformal covariance. So these, these have become, uh, th these type of features have been studied a lot, um, especially recently with new tools, and these are relatively simple models that only involve uh, random walk and Brownian motion and a Poisson point process. But with these models already, you can start to see all these crucial uh, features. And so that, that um, I think these are sort of nice models to present in this type of mini course. So let me start right away with a definition of what, what is this uh, random walk loop soup. If you, if, so a physicist would really call this uh, a gas, but the name was introduced by two mathematicians, Lawler and, and Werner. They decided to call it a soup. It's really an ideal gas. It, 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 it falls within the formalism of uh, uh, ideal gas in, in statistical mechanics. I'll mention that in a minute. Um, now, before I continue, now I'll, I'll, I'll have to give you some definitions and then I'll present some results. Um, please do interrupt me if there are questions. If, some of the definitions of what I say is not clear. So I start by, like I said, everything is two-dimensional. And for the first part of, the talk, of this uh, first lecture, I'll be thinking about uh, Z2, the square lattice. So imagine you have a square grid. Oops, that was not intended. So you start with the square grid. And for each vertex, to each vertex, I want to associate a positive number, possibly zero. Okay. And then I define 
these variables p, x, y, which you should think of as transition probabilities. Okay, so uh, transition probabilities between nearest neighbor vertices. So say associated to this edge between x and y, and y there is a p, x, y. So the p, x, y are zero unless x and y are at distance one. And otherwise, they take this form, and you see immediately when k x is zero, one over four is one, one divided by the number of nearest neighbors. That's a transition probability for sim simple symmetric random walk. And the way you interpret the k's when they're positive number, non-zero, you can think of those as killing rates. So you can think of these as transition probabilities of a random walk uh, which at every step has equal probability to jump to uh, each one of the neighbors, but it also has a certain probability of jumping to, uh, of dying in some sense, so jumping to uh, what you could call a, you could introduce a symmetry state to make this Markovian, and then you can think of the walk jumping to, with a certain probability to a symmetry state where it stays forever. Okay, so you can, you can interpret these as uh, transition probabilities uh, of a simple random walk uh, with, with killing. Is this clear to everyone? Is this, uh, this is a pretty st standard setup? Okay, so now I define geometric objects that I call rooted loops. A rooted loop is simply a sequence of vertices which are nearest neighbor vertices. And the last one, the last one is equal to the, to, the, to the first one. They can be repeated. So just uh, if you look at the that is a path, the trace forms a loop on Z2. Uh, so I call those objects rooted loops because they have a starting point, well defined, it's X naught. But I actually want to think about uh, loops in which, where I forget the root. So I define equivalence, I call a loop an equivalence class of rooted loops. Define up to rerouting. In some sense, what you do, you're forgetting the root. So all possible realizations of a of a rooted loop gives you an equivalence class. You can start at any point, and that's, that's what I call a loop. Okay, so it's, and on these objects, I introduce a measure. They can touch themselves. Yes, they can touch. They can, you can go, for example, the loop could be something like this. I jump like five times back and forth. That's, that's a loop. Okay, another loop could be, so this is, for example, a loop. So this could be x naught, x1, x2, x3. Okay, so, I'm, so the sequence x1, x2, x3, uh, sorry, uh, x0. So this is a rooted loop. If I forget the root, I get. Ah, uh, yes. There is an x4 which is equal to which is equal to x naught. So if I forget the root, uh, then I I have I have what I call a loop or unrooted loop. So then I, I I introduce a measure on these objects, and it, it's actually simpler than it may look at first sight. So a loop obviously uh, you need to have an even number of steps because you've got to go back to, the, to where you started. So uh, this row is the number of rooted loops in, 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 a, in a loop gamma. I call gamma a loop. Obviously, there are several because I can start, I can start anywhere here. So, so if you consider this particular example, the equivalence class corresponding to this loop contains four rooted loops. I can start at x0, x1, x2, or x3. Okay? So that's this uh, row of gamma. So I multiply row gamma uh, times the product of, of these transition probabilities, these numbers that, are, that you have to interpret as transition probabilities. And then I divide by the length of the loop. Okay. So, Chuck, you're, you're confused. So typically, these two factors actually cancel. Like in this case, 
the length of the loop is four, and there are four realizations, four rooted loops corresponding to that. That is not the case if you, if you repeat an edge several times. So that's why I write it this way. This is, morally speaking, you could forget about the first two terms, and it's just a product of the, yes? Yes, in the same, yes, the orientation is preserved, but you can start anywhere you want. So they are, uh, more precisely, they are defined by, if you want time translation, you can, but you have to follow them in the same order. So the orientation matters, but it doesn't matter where you start. Okay, so then I define a measure which is morally the product of these transition probabilities. And I want to do this inside some bounded domain, D. So I'm just asking that, this is not essential, but I'm asking that, uh, my loop gamma is contained in some domain D. Okay, so then I have enough information to define what I mean by a loop soup, and well, it's just a Poisson point process. But it's a Poisson point process, it's a sort of abstract Poisson point process because it's a Poisson point, it's a Poisson process on the space of loops. Okay, so these loops are the points of my space. And then, in order to define a Poisson point process, all you need to do is to tell me what the uh, intensity measure is. And I do have, so my intensity measure will be some constant, positive constant lambda times this measure. So a realization of this Poisson point process, every point is a loop. So a realization is a bunch of loops, and you can think of that on what I would call, say, physical space as uh, a bunch of uh, loops on Z2. Okay, is this clear? To this loop measure is not a probability measure? No. And does the total mass of it mean something? When we take, so eventually I'll take scaling limits and you get uh, an infinite measure. So the total mass doesn't mean anything because it's infinite. But it doesn't matter because I'm, I use it to produce a, a Poisson point process, so the, the intensity measure does not need to be a probability measure. Okay, so now you can be more explicit. Since this is a Poisson point process, uh, I'm saying a realization is a bunch of loops. In order to specify the realization, I have to tell you how many loops I have of, of each type can be 0, 1, 2, or any number, and these numbers will have a Poisson distribution. And they're all independent, so the probability of a realization, it's just the probability to see a certain collection of, uh, of multiplicities, one for each loop. And so I multiply over all possible, I take a product over all possible loops containing D, and each one of those loops will appear n gamma times, and these n gamma, what I'm telling you, what I'm saying is that these variables have a Poisson distribution. And that's what I wrote here. Okay, so this is, you see, this is a Poisson distribution and where lambda nu is the intensity measure. I hope everyone recognizes that this is just Poisson. So I have this, I have a one parameter family uh, with this parameter lambda. And, well, I can rewrite this uh, equation in this form. I, I take this product, and, and here I have this. Z is a normalization factor. And if you write, write out what that is, it's, well, the exponential of plus the sum over all loops of this term. So this is what that normalization factor looks like, um, product or exponential of the sum. And if you expand it, this is what you get. And I don't know how many people are familiar with uh, statistical mechanics, but if you're a little bit familiar with statistical mechanics, you look at this and if you stare at it a little bit, uh, actually very shortly, Dan is not here, but he would have recognized that instantly, I think. This looks like the, what, what physicists call the grand canonical partition function of an ideal gas of loops. Uh, so in an ideal gas, you imagine having particles moving around. Here, you're, instead of particles, you have loops. This gas is ideal because the loops do not interact with each other. So what physicists call an ideal gas, probably is called a Poisson point process. There's no interaction between the particles. 
And it's called a grand canonical uh, ensemble because in a grand canonical ensemble, the number of particles you have is not fixed. And this is the situation here. I, this is the term that comes from zero loops, and then you sum over all possible numbers of loops. There is a 1 over n factorial because this, when you expand this, you get a, an ordered sum. Uh, so here the order matters, the order in which the loops appear matters, and these loops are not necessarily disjoint. So gamma 1 and gamma n could be the same loop. So then you have to... Okay, so you have this sum, and this is the weight of each individual configuration, the product of the weights of the individual loops. Okay, so this is just to show you that you know, this is an object that looks very similar to objects that are studied in statistical mechanics. This is just an ideal gas. Okay, so now I hope that object is, uh, I mean, it's, when you see it for the first time, it's maybe hard to remember everything, but just remember we have some measure on loops, and that's morally the product of these uh, transition probabilities which correspond to a random walk, possibly with some killing. And you use that measure on loops to produce a Poisson point process. So a realization would be a bunch of loops with a certain law. Okay, so that's one object. And now I'm introducing another object which is much more familiar with people doing probability and statistical mechanics, and it's something that uh, luckily uh, Louis Pierre already talked about, so I can be quite fast. That's a discrete Gaussian free field. I'll, I'll redefine it anyway, just to fix the notation. Um, and, well, actually, he, he didn't describe it in this way, but he talked exactly about this, this the same object. This is, what he introduced is a Dirichlet, is, is a Gaussian free field with zero or Dirichlet bound. And so, essentially, you have a Gaussian free field inside a, within a bounded domain. You assume that outside of the domain, the field is zero everywhere. And then, so, it's, it's essentially just a bunch of mean zero Gaussian random variables, which are not independent, though, and the dependence, the covariance is given by the, as, he, as, as we Pierre mentioned, is given by the Green's function of the random walk. He talked about what one would call the massless Gaussian free field. So if you take, uh, if you take these transition probabilities as I define them with the kx equals zero everywhere, then you really have the simple symmetric random walk. And if you look at the Green's function for that, then you get the correlations, uh, the covariance for the so-called massless Gaussian free field. If you do have a, if you introduce some kind of killing, then uh, you get an object that, that is what, what is called a mass, uh, massive Gaussian free field. And the square root of these uh, numbers kx would be called the mass of the Gaussian free field. In this case, the mass can change, can be different at uh, 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 different vertices. Okay, so that's the object. There's another way to think about it, uh, which is closer to the way of thinking of people in statistical mechanics, uh, using a Hamiltonian, a partition function, and thinking about this model as a Gibson model. So this, the, the field that I defined in the previous slide is something that has defined on R to the, to the D. So D ash is the intersection of D with Z2. So you can imagine that you have Z2 and you take some, some domain D. So I'm only looking at the vertices of Z2 that are inside D. Um, so at, at each one of these vertices, you have a you have a random variable, which will turn out to be a Gaussian random variable. And you have a density with respect to the Lebesgue measure, which is given by this expression where z is, again, what we call the partition function. It is just a normalization factor, so you just integrate over the exponential. And so what, de what defines the model is really the Hamiltonian, which is a sort of energy function. And you should recognize this term that uh, you've seen in Louis Louis Pierre's uh, talk. So you can think about, you can actually, one way to think about this model is a sort of random height model. You can think as phi x as denoting a height, and you can think about this as, a, if you interpolate linearly between vertices, you can think of this as a, a, as a random surface. 
and you can think of phi x as the height at, at x. And there is a term which tells you that nearest neighbors would like to have roughly the same height. That's where the correlations come from. And the other terms are not so crucial, but th this is the mass. So typically when you, when you write this Hamiltonian, you write an m squared for the mass, which is why I told you that in this definition, the square root of k is the mass of the field, of this massive field. And this term is simply uh, because what I'm defining is what I, what, what I would call a zero uh, boundary condition or Dirichlet field. It means that, so this vertex has this vertex as, as neighbor, but I, I've decided that this phi is zero. So when you read here phi squared, so this is phi x minus zero to the power two, corresponding to interaction between a vertex here to a vertex just outside of D. Okay, so that's the structure of the Hamiltonian. So this is the main part, this is the mass, the term containing the mass, and this just tells you about the boundary condition, the fact that it's a zero boundary condition. And you can rewrite it in this more compact form, which is interesting though, because you see that, uh, again, if you're familiar with statistical mechanics, it, you can write it in a way that looks like a spin model, where you have the product of uh, spins, uh, nearest neighbor spins. Okay, so that's, that's uh, this is another way of defining the, looking at the discrete Gaussian free field, and then you might ask now, why am I defining these two models that don't seem to have very much in common? But you notice that, um, well, okay, so here is one, one result, uh, which I want to give you right away, because um, my claim at the beginning was that these loop models, or loop soup models, have interesting deep connections with uh, more standard models of statistical mechanics and probability. So here is one example right away. The loop soup uh, model that I defined is connected in several ways actually to the Gaussian free field. And here is one that I particularly like, uh, which I, because I find it very intuitive and quite nice to, uh, 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 to visualize. So this result tells you, so suppose I'm taking, so now I'll, uh, I'll use the board. So again, su suppose I have a domain D and I look at the intersection with Z2. And I define a Gaussian free field inside D, as I said previously. Oops. I keep doing this. Yeah, here we are. So, and then I take another domain, uh, D prime, which is a subset of D. So what you can think of uh, is, imagine that I'm just taking away a piece of D. So suppose I remove this part and I get a new domain, D prime. So D prime is a subset of D. You don't have to do it. It can be any subset, but I like to think about it as changing the boundary of D prime of D to get a smaller domain. Okay, so then the result says, so you have two Gaussian free fields, one defined in D and one in D prime. The result says that in some sense you can compare the two and you can ask, so suppose I start with a Gaussian, I'm gonna say it in an informal way that doesn't make sense and then I'll tell you the precise statement. So suppose I have a vertex X naught here and I take a Gaussian free field in D, and then I remove, I change the boundary of the domain. How does the Gaussian free field, how does the strength, say, of, of the field changes? How does it change at x naught? This doesn't really make sense the way I said it, but in some sense you could ask, what is the influence of changing the, the domain? How does it influence the field at some site uh, inside the domain? Now the way to make sense of it is to say that one can find a coupling, you, you need to be able to construct these two objects on the same probability space. So one can find a coupling between these two objects, uh, between the fields, the three fields in D and D prime, uh, in such a way that the probability that 
the values of the two fields at x naught are not the same is precisely the probability that in the random walk loop soup in D, when you do a random walk loop soup in D, there is, a, there is one loop that goes through, that goes through x naught and intersects this part of the boundary. So it, it must intersect d minus d prime, and uh, it must, well, let me write it this way, and x naught must be contained, so it, it must go through gamma, uh, through x naught, and it must intersect. So that tells you that if there is no loop that intersects this part, then the two fields will have the same value. Yes, and you have, in order for this to work, and this is important, it only works for a very special value of lambda, and that value is one half. So I have a one parameter family, but if I want to make a connection with the Gaussian free field, I have to fix this lambda, and I have to take it equal to one half. Yes? I don't understand something, but those phi are continuous. Yes, yes, so this, what I'm saying is the probability that they're not the same. Oh, there's a coupling. There's a coupling, yes. That's why, the, yeah, so I, what this says is you can actually couple the two and, and, the, and the random walk loop soup. So you have the coupling between three objects. And, and the probability that the, the two values of the fields are not the same is the probability that there is a loop. That goes. So in some sense, the reason I like this results is it tells you that in some sense, this random walk loop soup that when you define it doesn't seem to have anything to do with the Gaussian free field sort of carries a correlation from the boundary because it tells you how likely it is that if you change your domain how likely it is that uh, the field will change at some site far away and you can also start yes uh, I'll come to that so what I'm saying is this statement there is a coupling so that you can compute the probability that the, uh, the two values at x naught are not the same, you can compute that using the random walk loop soup without talking about Gaussian free fields. Yes, yeah, the, there is a coupling involving all three objects, yes. The statement doesn't need, uh, the statement is just about probability, so, but in fact the way you prove it is you couple all three objects together. The proof is actually very simple once you have another result that I'll mention. So I, I like it because it suggests that indeed this uh, random walk loop soup somehow carries the correlations and that's what you see when you take a scaling limit in some sense, I'm not sure how much I'll be able to say about that, but the Brownian loop soup somehow carries correlations from the boundary in, in models of statistical mechanics once you take the scaling limit. And this you can see that explicitly here in this result in a very simple way. And you can also see that if you don't have, a, if your kx are all equally, uh, are all zero, so there is no killing, then you have, uh, you will, you're, you're thinking about simple symmetric random walk, and then random walk can make large loops, but if you introduce a killing, then large loops will be suppressed, because the walk is, has a certain chance of being killed. I'll make that more precise. So it already tells you that correlations in a, in a massive, uh, Gaussian free fields should be much smaller, and in fact, they decay exponentially. So it's, I think it's a very nice, um, it's a simple result, but uh, it, it tells you already that there have to be, there are some very deep connections. And so the, these uh, strange looking models, Poisson point processes, and uh, they actually are very connected to other more standard models. So how do you prove that? Well, uh, I don't really want to give you a proof, but I want to mention something. There is, a, there is another connection, which I do want to mention, between the Gaussian free field and, and, the, uh, uh, and the random walk loop soup. And in order to do that, though, I, I need a little bit more, more definition. So, um, yeah, so what I want to get to is this isomorphism theorem, which was proved by Lejeune recently in around 2009-10. Um, to do that, let me introduce some notation. So I will call nx gamma the number of times that a loop gamma visits site x. As, as I said before, it can come to a site x many times. And then I define an occupation time. 
essentially what I'm doing is every time uh, a loop comes to uh, vertex x, um, I count a random time, which is given by an exponential random variable with mean 1. Okay, so I take a sum of exponential random variables, and for every site, how many of these exponential random variables I have depends on how many times gamma was on that vertex. And then I simply normalize by this factor, which is 1 over k plus 4. Um, so this defines an occupation time at x for every loop gamma. I then want to define an occupation field for the whole loop soup. So the loop soup is a, is a collection of, of uh, loops. So at x, what you do is you, you just take the sum over all the loops in, in your loop soup, and you take the sum of the occupation times. But you have to, to add something else. Um, you have to add another term, which is what you could call half of a trivial loop. A trivial loop is a, is, a, is a loop of length zero that just touches one point and never moves and stays there for half of an exponential random variable. And this is necessary, so that means that even if there is a vertex that is not visited by any of the loops, it will have some occupation value. And that is necessary, otherwise I'll have, I would have uh, values of the occupation field that are, that are zero. And that never happens for a Gaussian free field, because those are Gaussian random variables. So if you construct these th things this way, so you, in other words, if you find this confusing, you can think of the loops as random walks, and you can think of them in continuous time. The random walker spends an, an exponential amount of time at each, at each vertex and you just sum up all the, all the time spent at every vertex, plus you have to add these sort of trivial loops, which are half, half of an exponential random variable. Okay? So, the exact definition is not really so important, but uh, once you define an occupation field in this way, then you have this nice result, which I mean, could have been proved a long time ago, but it was only noted by Lejeune in 2010. So if you take, a, uh, again, notice that I have to choose lambda to be equal a half. Lambda is the density in my uh, random walk loop soup. If I construct a Gaussian, uh, if I construct uh, an occupation field, so I, I, I take a realization of the random walk loop soup, I construct a, an occupation field, and then I look, I, uh, on the same domain D, I take a Gaussian free field. It turns out that the occupation field has the same distribution as half of the square of the Gaussian free field. Something that is not intuitive at all. There's no clear reason why the, the, this occupation field of this random walk loop soup should have this, should in, in any way be related to the, um, to the Gaussian free field, but there is a, there is a there is a relation, and, and this is what it is. So one half the square of the Gaussian free field has the same distribution as the, this occupation time. And the proof is actually, uh, in principle, I could even have given you the complete proof because it's just a computation. What you do is you compute the Laplace transform of these two objects, and you just do Gaussian integration, and you see that those two coincide. So you don't really learn much about why this is the case, but it just happens, happens to be the case. Well, if you look at, if you start working with these objects and you look at the formulas, then you start, you see that, <laughs> if you have enough training, I guess, you see that they start to look, uh, but like I said, I mean, this could have been proved uh, 30 years ago. <laughs> Just, and, and it is actually similar to some results. There, there were previous isomorphism theorems, like the dinking isomorphism theorems. So this is in the same family, but this particular formulation was never noted until recently. So yeah, can you compare with the Dinkin uh, isomorphism? Um, because it's very similar. It, it is very similar, but it's not the same. Because this is got, it's also yes, Gaussian it's also field. it's also Gaussian free field. It's also, free one, field. Half it's also one half. It does the the Dinkin isomorphism doesn't have explicitly the uh, random walk loop soup. So that particular object, in fact, this object was. 
introduced by Lawler, but really uh, the random walk loop soup and the Brownian loop soup, in some sense, existed already in physics literature from the 70s and 80s. It was, they were essentially introduced by Simansic. Right. Not, not so explicitly, but so they've been rediscovered uh, like 30, 40 years later by probabilists. But when Simansic was working on Euclidean field theory, he already had these ideas similar. So yeah, once you have this result actually proving, proving this uh, is not that it's actually quite becomes kind of an exercise if you want. Um, well, I don't want to spend, so let's see. I don't, I'm not sure I want to spend too much time. Um, what, that, let me just say the following, that using this result by Lejeune, you can, you can immediately couple the uh, uh, random walk loop soup with the uh, Gaussian free field in a simple way. Um, essentially, what you what you can do is you can you can take a, a random walk loop soup. You construct the uh, well. You have to add these uh, IID random variables. Uh, I just want to point out that Lejeune actually uses somewhat different definitions. Um, of the random walk loop soup, um, so not a, and, and construct the occupation field in a slightly different way, but things are completely equivalent. So for this particular version uh, and this particular set of definitions, you can find the complete computation to prove this result in, in this paper. This is a paper of mine, but the computation really follows uh, previous computations by the, done by Lejeune, and you can find similar computations in. Uh, lecture notes by uh, Alan Sol Snitman. And it's really just a computation. You compute the Laplace transform of one object, the other one, and you see that they are identical after a, after a Gauss Gaussian integration. But it's a nice, it's a nice result. But then you can, you can think immediately that you can couple the uh, random walk loop soup in the Gaussian free field. So you, you take a domain D, you do a random walk loop soup in D, you, co you construct the occupation fields, and you already have the squares of your, of your um, Gaussian free field. You already have the half of the squares. But now you have to choose the signs. So you can say, well, at, every, at, at the vertex x, the amplitude of the Gaussian free field will be, the, uh, will be essentially the square root of, of the occupation field. But then you have to decide if, the, if phi x is positive or negative. But if you, if you rewrite the Hamiltonian in this form, where you sort of decouple the sine and the, and the modulus using, did I write it? Yeah, using this form. So you can write phi as the absolute value of phi times, times the sine of phi. And the absolute value of phi is the square root of the occupation field. So you get something that looks kind of funny. It's a, it looks like a kind of uh, random easing model. It might be interesting to study its property, but I haven't done that. But it's easy to see that you can, you can come up with a coupling that you can actually then use. Uh, so when I said proving this result becomes an exercise, it's essentially once you use, once you know this isomorphism theorem, and you notice this coupling, then you can prove that result quite easily. Um, but I don't, yeah, so I, I even put the proof here, but I don't, I'm not sure I wanna, I wanna go through it. Um, yes. Uh, this, yes. It looks, yes, but it's, it's funny because you have the product of, uh, so the, the strength of, is given by the product of the, of the occupation field at, at, so at these two neighboring vertices. So it looks, uh, I've never seen in the literature anything like, it looks like, it looks like a strange uh, spin glass model maybe. Yeah. It is ferromagnetic, yes. It is ferromagnetic, which makes sense because if you are, say large and positive, your neighbor is going to be positive rather than negative. So there should be an incentive to have the same sign. 
So it's a it's kind of um, interesting interesting looking model. Um, so let me let me skip this uh, the proof of this boundary correlation theorem. But, um, and let me talk instead about uh, continuum scaling limits. So now I want to talk about scaling limits. As I said, a lot of the uh, interesting results that I mentioned at the beginning um, have to do with scaling limits of models of statistical mechanics in two dimensions. So the Fields medals that I mentioned 2006, 2010, uh, Wendelin Werner and Stas Mirnov have to do with uh, SLE and scaling limits. So what is a scaling limit? Now, I'll explain it in this context, but the idea is quite general. We, I started with a model, this uh, random walk loop soup, which, which is defined on a lattice. And now what I want to do is I want to rescale the lattice. And now time probably doesn't make, um, when I define the loops, there was really no time. But I ask you to think about uh, the think of the loops as generated by a random walker, which jumps, say, uh, at every time interval, jump, jumps to a, one of the neighbors. So in some sense, what I'm doing here is Brownian scaling. And in fact, the very first, and perhaps in some sense, the, very, the most important example of conformal invariance uh, is not something that was studied in the last 10 years, but it was, but it goes back quite a long time. And it's uh, Brown in motion. So random walk, as everyone knows, converges to Brown in motion. And Brown in motion is, in some sense, conformal invariance. If you, if you, if you do Brown in motion in a domain, you look at the uh, exit probabilities. So this goes back, if I'm not wrong, to Levy and, uh, and Kakutani. I mean, in, in two dimensions, yes. I'm everything, like I said at the beginning, everything that I, everything is two dimensional in this, in this talk. So that's really the prototypical example of a scaling limit that gives you something conformal invariant. And in some sense, the, the simplest model that you can think of, and it's in some sense statistical mechanics as well. So you want to do a sort of uh, uh, Brownian scaling. What I mean by that is think of a loop uh, as a, at least a, a rooted loop. Think, about, think, of, think of a rooted loop as a, as a continuous function. So you interpolate between the sides. You can think about this as a, uh, of this as a continuous function in R2 or in the, on the complex plane. It's convenient to, to, to work on the complex plane. So if gamma is a loop of length 2n, uh, you think about it as a continuous function on the complex plane by linear interpolation. Say then a rescaled loop is you take the, the image or the, the trace will be scaled by 1 over n. But time, I want to multiply it by essentially n squared, 2n squared. So that gives me a new function, uh, so the trace will be will shrink by a factor of n, and you speed up time indeed by 2n squared, so the, the time length is now uh, t gamma divided by 2n squared. Okay, so you can think of doing this to the to the random walk loop soup, and well, what what you should get as as even if you don't know yet what that means, is obviously a Brownian loop soup because random walk converges to Brownian motion. And, well, that's precisely what happens. So let's first look at the case when all the, uh, the killing rates are all equal to zero. Then I'm looking at simple symmetric random walk. And this was studied by Lawler and, and one of his students, former students. They show that in some sense that I'll will not make very precise, but in some sense, as you would, would expect, the random walk loop soup converges to a Brownian loop soup, except that I haven't told you what the Brownian loop soup is. So this statement is empty right now. Um, and, but you, what you do is you want, you want to look at sort of macroscopic loops. I won't be very precise, but uh, in some sense, loops that are small, when you scale it by a factor of 1 over n, will sort of disappear and, and, con and, and will become single points. So only large loops will survive. So when, once you rescale time, the loop should be still relatively large. And well, in the original results, there's no, this is not really specified, but say, so it, do, it doesn't really matter. So if you look at 
macroscopically large loop, loops that are not too small, then you have converges to an object that you can call the uh, Brownian loop soup. In fact, the Brownian loop soup was defined and introduced be before the random walk loop soup was defined. <laughs> so the random walk loop soup really was born as the discrete version of the Brownian loop soup and as the object that should converge to the Brownian loop soup. So what is this Brownian loop soup? Now I'll take a couple of slides to introduce the Brownian loop soup. And the idea is very similar to that of the random walk loop soup, except that now we are in, uh, on, on, on a, we're not on, this, in a, on a discrete space. Um, so I'll start again with rooted loops. A rooted loop is now a continuous function. I'll call it gamma r. Continuous function on the complex plane. Uh, so for some finite time, and it starts and ends at the same point. So it is a closed, a closed uh, loop, indeed, a closed uh, curve. I want to introduce uh, a measure on such, such loops. And since I want to get to something that I want to call the Brownian loop soup, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start by uh, taking a Brownian bridge measure. So does everyone know what a Brownian bridge is? So a two-dimensional Brownian bridge is, in some sense, a two-dimensional Brownian motion that is conditioned to end where it started. Uh, that doesn't really make sense, but... Uh, so th this is one, one way that makes sense to define a Brownian bridge of time length one started at the origin. You take a two-dimensional uh, random walk, you subtract t times the random walk at time one, and this obviously makes a loop. It comes back to where it started. And you can take this and you can move it to any point z on the plane. So this one starts at zero and ends at zero. You can make it start anywhere you want. And you can rescale time. So instead of time length one, you can make it uh, of time length t by using Brownian scaling. So that gives you a Brownian, a Brownian loop or a Brownian bridge. And so once you have this Brownian bridge measure, you can define a new measure. This was introduced by uh, Lawler and Werner. It was studied by Lawler and Werner and then by Werner himself. And this is what I will call a rooted Brownian loop measure. So it's a measure on rooted loops. And so this might be a little bit hard to digest after lunch. But uh, so what you do is you, you so this A is area, so that means your loop is rooted. It can start anywhere on Z. So, and you decide that using Lebesgue measure. And then you can have any time length between zero and infinity, but larger loops are suppressed by a factor one over T squared. And then when you give me a loop, I look at its measure as if I ask what's the probability that this particular uh, curve was produced by a, by a random by a Brownian bridge, and this is this part starting at z and of duration t. So that's this part. Okay. So this is a probability measure, but the whole thing is an infinite measure, and it actually blows up at zero, obviously, because you have many small loops. Uh, it does blow up at zero and at infinity. Yeah, so it's not immediately obvious. Uh, there is a 1 over, uh, I knew this question was coming. It's not so high. There is this 1 over n, and you might ask, why not 1 over n squared? Yeah. Um, it's not so immediately obvious. Uh, but you see, the, the, I guess the point is that, so one point I want to make, which is actually important, here I'm talking about rooted loops. I actually want to look at unrooted loops. So I want to look at equivalence classes. Again, as before, you remember I started with rooted loops, and then I said, I now I want to forget the root. You want to do the same here. Before you, take, before you use this as your intensity measure for your Poisson process, you want to remove this R. And that means you want to think about this measure as a, as a measure of unrooted loops. So what is an unrooted loop? Again, it's an equivalence class of rooted loops, okay? So 
essentially what you do is you, you forget the root. You define an equivalence class by time translation. If you translate your starting point, you still have a closed loop. Okay, so that defines an equivalence class. And the measure of that equivalence class is, in some sense, the sum of the measures according to this of all the elements in that equivalence class. So you are kind of summing over t. So you lose the one of you. You kind of sum over all the starting points. That's why there so is it's one. Like over having a uniform measure on zero t. Yes. Yes. It's like having a. Yes. You you can think of this as you can think of the trace of the loop, and then you can start anywhere on the on the loop. So that that uh, compensates for the one one over the one of the t's. Oh yes, so the, the, I think there is a missing, uh, ah, yes, I, I remember that at some point and then I forgot to add it. There is a, an indicator function, there should be here an indicator function that the loop has to be contained in D, not just the starting point. I remember seeing that and then I forgot about it and then I was looking for the place where I should add the indicator function and I, <laughs> so there it is. So here and in this next slide, uh, this tells you that the starting point is in D, but the whole loop should be in D, so there should be an indicator function that says the loop should, be, should stay in D for the whole time. Okay, so the, the, the Brownian loop measure is the measure, I, didn't, I, I wrote it in exactly the same way, but the way you have to interpret it is different. You have to interpret this as a measure on uh, unrooted loops. Okay, so loops without, so you have to sum essentially over all possible starting points. Okay, the, the notation is not perfect. But this is the notation you find in all papers, so I'm just sticking to the uh, Werner and Lawler papers. Um, it looks a bit confusing, but okay. So you have this. In, in any case, so you have this measure on, on Brownian loops, and now you do the same thing as before. Uh, you take well, you have your domain D. You take a number lambda positive, and you do a Poisson point process on the space of loops. So a realization is a bunch of these Brownian loops. And the fact is that you know, this measure is an infinite measure. So this Poisson point process is going to be a little bit uh, strange in the sense that every realization has an infinite number of, of points. Okay. So every realization will have an infinite number of points and there will be loops at all scales. Okay, so in that sense it's not a one of the most ordinary uh, Poisson point processes. But the message is, again, you have some measure on, on loops based on Brownian motion, on Brownian bridge. You use that as your intensity measure, and you construct a Poisson point process where the points are loops. And if you do that, and I will not prove this, but this is central, uh, this object has two very important properties that actually make it unique. In some sense, you can show that this is the unique object that has these two properties. Two properties are restriction. So this comes easily from the fact that it's a, it's a Poisson point process. If you take a, a domain D prime containing D, so you, you generate a Brownian loop soup in D, um, you take away a piece, and you remove all the loops that intersect that part. So if this loop intersect this part, I have to throw it away because it would go out of my new domain D prime. Okay, so you, you only keep the loops that were completely contained in D prime to begin with. You look at that set of loops, it has the same distribution as a, as a Brownian loop soup in D prime. This is called restriction. It's a sort of Markov property in some sense. Um, we here talked about Markov properties before. And then the other essential property is the conformal invariance. The conformal invariance tells you that if I have two domains, some D and D prime, so this is the main reason why uh, this object is so important and, and it's been studied so much. So suppose I have two domains, D and D prime. I can do a Brownian loop soup in D. It will be some bunch of, uh, a bunch of Brownian loops. OK, 
Okay, I can do an independent Brownian loop soup in, in, in D prime. I have another bunch of Brownian loops. But what I can also do, so this, this will have some distribution, this will have some distribution. The distribution will depend on the, on the domain. But what I can also do is I can generate a Brownian loop soup in here, and then I take any conformal map, call it F, I take any conformal map from here to there, there are infinitely many of them, as long as I'm talking about bounded domains, that's Riemann's mapping theorem. And I look at the images of the loops. I get a bunch of curves here. I look at how they are distributed, distributed and, and they're, again, distributed like a Brownian loop soup in D prime. So that's what is called conformal invariance. If you take a conform, an image by a conformal map, you get, again, the same object in this new domain. In this sense, the, conformal, the, the uh, Brownian loop soup is conformal invariant. Yes? Is the conformal version unique? No, no, there are infinitely many. There are infinitely many. Any. For any. It doesn't matter which one. So Brownian loops, this is a simulation done by a co-author of mine. I don't know how to make simulations. So Brownian loops would look like <laughs> something like, like this, I guess. And you know, this would be two, two Brownian loops. And loop soup <laughs> looks, so th this, depending on lambda, of course, lambda tells you how many loop, how dense this soup is. You know, the, 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 the bigger the lambda, the thicker your soup. So if lambda, lambda is relatively small, you have, of course, these loops are everywhere. It's a Poisson process. They don't know about each other, so they will overlap. And these, of course, are simulations that are obviously truncated because if you really look at the Brownian loop soup, it has loops at all scales. It is scale invariant. And, and so th this, is, uh, this is how they might look like, I'm not really sure. The trace of the this is the trace, yes. Yeah. So th these are the images of the traces of the loops. So yeah, a Poisson point process is on the space of loops. A realization is a bunch of loops. If you look down in what I could call physical space, you put down the traces, this is what the type of image that you would get, probably. So the, the, the properties, these properties in particular, the, so the restriction, they come from the fact that it's, I'm talking about a Poisson point process, but the conformal invariance comes from the fact that here I have Brownian motion, and Brownian motion is a conformal invariant object. So in fact, the conformal invariance of this Brownian loop soup is inherited by, from, uh, from the Brownian loop measure, which itself has a conformal invariance property, which I will, yes? It's crucial, yes. Without the t-squared, the computation doesn't... Well, you'll see, it, you'll see it here. The t-squared is this square. It's Brownian scaling. It's a time change. And you need the t-squared. So, so let me talk about the conformal invariance for this Brownian loop measure. Now take a conformal map like here. Uh, by this I denote the image of a loop Okay, now I'm not interested only in the trace, but really the loop with the parametrization. So if I want conformal invariance, I have, to, I, I have to map the trace, but I also have to change the parametrization of the loop. And I have to do it carefully. I want to change the parametrization in this way. So, I, uh, the, so this new loop is, has the trace is the image of this loop gamma of t parameterized according to this s, which, is, which has this form. And if you know a little bit of conformal maps, this is a conformal map. So the modulus of a conformal map at a given point z tells you the amount of uh, dilation at that point. So you, may, you probably have heard at some point that, or at least if you're a physicist, you may have heard that conformal map is just a translation plus a rotation plus a dilation. That is in some sense correct if you look at the Jacobian of a conformal map. It, it's a constant times a rotation matrix, and that constant is the modulus of the derivative of the conformal map at that point. So you can think of a conformal map. A conformal map is a map that preserves angles. This is another not very precise definition of conformal map. So I'm just, I just gave you two non -very pre, no, not very precise definitions. Uh, 
Uh, a third one, which is more precise, is that a conformal map in two dimensions is any uh, analytic function whose derivative is not zero on a domain. So that every such function is a conformal map. So this tells you the modulus of the of f prime tells you the amount the amount of dilation at a given point when you do a conformal map. So if you if you look at z, and, and this will be mapped into f of z, the amount of dilation going from here to there is the modulus of f prime, which is never 0. So, so now, if you take a collection of loops, uh, let me say a is a collection of loops, I can look at the images of, the, of those loops by looking at the images of the traces and, and changing the parametrization. And this is a beautiful result uh, by Werner, 2008. This uh, mu measure that I defined here, so this Brownian loop measure, I defined it in this way, which can be a bit confusing, especially after lunch, but I could have defined it as in a very elegant way as telling you, well, it's the unique measure up to a multiplicative constant because it's an infinite measure, but it's a unique measure on, I'll explain what I mean by simple planar loops, that has these two following properties. One is simply the restriction. So if you look at this measure on a domain which is a subset of D, uh, so if you look, if you restrict the measure to a subset D prime, you get the measure in that domain that reminiscent of this restriction property, morally the same. And the other thing is conformal invariance. So if I take the measure in D prime, D prime is the image of F of D after, uh, under F, and I look at the image of these bunch of loops. So that measure is the same as the original measure in D of the original set of loops A. So that's conformal invariance. So the conformal invariance of the Brownian loop soup is inherited, comes from, from this. Um, now you might ask, why am I talking about simple planar loops? A Brownian loop is certainly not simple. Uh, but what you have to think about is whenever you have a Brownian loop, which will typically be very complicated, okay, you can look at the boundary, the outer boundary of, a of the Brownian loop, so you take the frontier or the boundary, that's a, simple, that's a simple curve. The topological boundary, if you want a precise definition, take the, take the complex plane minus your loop gamma. You have an infinite number, typically, of uh, domains. There's only one which is unbounded that you can call the outside of the loop. The topological boundary of that unbounded domain is what you could call the boundary of the loop. More prosaic terms, you could think of filling in the loop, form a sort of blob, and then the boundary of that blob. So if you think of the, you can also think of the, of the loop measure as a loop on, on, on such objects, which are now simple curves. There is only one measure that has on, on such simple planar loops, there is only one measure that has these properties. So these two properties uh, define uniquely that, that one measure. So, and in particular, so in some sense, there is only one conformally invariant measure on simple loops on the plane. That's what makes this object particularly nice because it, it, is, a unique, it is a unique object. And so it's, it's a sen it is this object that you want to use as the intensity measure of your Brownian loop soup. And that, yeah, yes? Yeah, so I said originally the intensity measure was not on simple loops. No, 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 no. But you can, you can define uh, a measure on simple loops. You can think of this as a, as a measure on simple loops. So you, you, gi you give me a simple loop, I can ask what's the probability that this is the boundary of a Brownian loop. And so I can use this measure, mu, d, where is it? I can use this measure, and I can think of it as a measure on simple loops in that sense. So actually, you are looking at the, the image measure of the loop, which is a measure, but 
on the outer boundary. Yes, the outer boundary, yes. So as I defined it here, it's a measure on non-simple loops, but I can use it as a measure on simple loops. I give you a simple loop and I can ask, what's the, what's, what's the weight of that as a boundary of a, of a I, can talk, I cannot talk about probabilities because it's an infinite measure, but I can, I can look at the set of all Brownian loops that have that as a boundary, I take the measure of that, that set, and that gives me, that then gives me a measure on, 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 uh, on this particular contour, which obviously will be zero, but yes, you, you get the idea. Okay? So I can interpret, the, I can think of this as a measure on simple loops, and if I think of, uh, of this measure as a measure on simple loops, it's the unique measure with those two properties. There is no other measure up to multiplicative constant because it's obviously, it's an infinite measure, but that's unique. This is a beautiful result. Not even too hard to prove. So now, now I, I want to talk a little bit about a, a connections between this. So I introduced this. I went, as I told you, the Brownian loop soup was introduced before the random walk loop soup. I introduced the random walk loop soup first, and then I said, well, you take a scaling limit, it converges to the Brownian loop soup. I told you the random walk loop soup itself is connected, for example, to the uh, Gaussian free field. Now, the Brownian loop soup has also connections, deep connections with models of statistical mechanics. And the most straightforward and, and in some sense, key, key uh, and the most interesting connection is, uh, comes about when you start to do loop soup percolation. So loop soup percolation means this. Um, take a Brownian loop soup and form clusters of loops. So what you do is the following. If two loops intersect, uh, you say that they belong to the same cluster. Okay, so you can form clusters of loops. And now, first of all, you can see that there is a phase transition, a percolation phase transition. So you're doing your Brownian loop soup in a domain D, and you construct clusters. Uh, first of all, you can prove that there is a critical value of lambda. Lambda is the thickness of your soup, so to speak. Um, yeah, so, sorry, this should be a zero. Uh, yeah, no, if lambda, so if la lambda is a positive number, if lambda is smaller than a certain value, which is smaller than infinity, so it's a finite number, then when you do this loop soup percolation, you actually, you do see uh, many disjoint clusters. So in some sense, you can say that the loops do not percolate. However, if lambda is larger than this critical value, then you see just one blob. There's only one cluster, you can prove more than that. If you remove all of the loops and their interiors, what is left is uh, what is called a totally disconnected set. So it's made of single points. So not very much is left. Okay, so there is a phase transition. And you can prove more. So this, this follows from results of Werner, but also results of myself and, and, uh, and Eric Broman. In particular, the fact that the, the complement is totally disconnected. One interesting fact, which is quite unusual for people who study percolation, is that there is no percolation. Uh, so in this case, you, you would say the complement percolates. The, the loops themselves form, uh, do not percolate, because you do have many clusters, not, not a single one. What is interesting is that this regime, so the critical point belongs to this regime. Usually when you talk about percolation, um, so you don't have percolation at the critical point. Here, if you look at the complement of the loops, so imagine throwing out all the loops and their interiors, the complement of the loops percolate for lambda less than lambda c, but also at lambda c. This is unusual for uh, lattice percolation, but it is what you get when you, when you do fractal percolation, for those who know what that is. Now what is interesting, Sheffield and, and Werner proved that this critical value is exactly one. And then there is an interesting fact. So let me erase here and then I'll try to explain what happens. So suppose I now take a number kappa, 
between eight thirds um, I guess this is so take a number kappa between eight thirds and four and choose your lambda according to this form this formula you can say you can see that in this interval of values of kappa lambda goes from 0 to 1 kappa equals 4 corresponds to 1 so okay so you choose your lambda and you do so you have you have a domain you fix your lambda you have kappa you fix a lambda as a function of kappa you do your Brownian loop soup so you'll have a bunch of loops some of them intersect okay if they intersect I put them in the same cluster when they don't intersect so lambda will be smaller than one as long as kappa is smaller than four so I have separate clusters of loops and now I I you can fill in all the loops all the clusters so to speak what I mean by that is look at the collection of boundaries of clusters I look at the collection of boundaries of clusters okay so the collection of boundaries of clusters is distributed like an object that is called CLE kappa CLE stands for conformal loop ensemble and what makes it special is that if you look at one of these curves one of these boundaries locally it is distributed like an SLE kappa so this locally this is locally so locally this curve is described by a schramm levener evolution with parameter kappa the kappa you started with and so that's interesting because the SLE, SLE is related to many models of statistical mechanics so I can give you one uh, I can give you one specific example which uh, should be interesting to hear about at least for those who know something about about statistical mechanics and the easy model so if you don't know what the easy model is um, It looks a little bit like <laughs> the Gaussian free field when you <laughs> so I, I could actually well so the easy model let me tell you what the easy model is in two words so this is you have spin variables take values plus one or minus one on Z2 and then let me call S is a collection of spin variables. Let me do this on a bound on a on a piece of Z2. Uh, the probability of S is proportional to uh, e to the some constant beta times the sum S X S Y sum over nearest neighbors. Okay, so individual variables are called spin variables that can be up or down one or minus one and you have a configuration every configuration has a weight a probability which is proportional to this there is obviously a normalization uh, const, uh, constant beta is what is called the inverse temperature you see the effect is simply that two neighbors spins one they want to have the same sign because larger probabilities you want to maximize the sum so the best thing you can do is to take everything plus or everything minus how strong this effect is will depend on beta so for example if beta is equal to zero it doesn't matter at all all configurations have the same probability that corresponds to infinite temperature complete chaos and this is a very interesting model because it has a phase transition it was actually the first model where it was shown that phase transitions exist mathematically in some sense now it has a critical temperature which I think um, 
I remember correctly, the critical value of beta is this number, but it doesn't matter. Now what's interesting is, suppose I, I take a domain D and I say that the spins outside of my domain D are all plus. So that's choosing the boundary condition. For the, for the Gaussian free field, I told you, you've set the field to be equal to zero. For this model, take plus everywhere outside, deterministically. And then you take an easy model inside. So some of the spins will be plus, some of the spins will be minus when you take a realization. And now look at the contours. So some of the spins inside will be plus, and then you will see some minuses. And look at the contours between pluses and minuses. Okay, so there will be a kind of a sea of pluses and there will be islands of minuses. Then they have inside lakes. There will be, but don't go inside. Just look at the outer contours. Okay, so you have minuses here and pluses outside. Okay. Now take this. This is on, on, on uh, do this on a rescaled lattice, which is A times Z2. Okay, so you shrink your lattice, take a scaling limit, let A go to zero. So you could do this on Z2 times 1 over N and N goes to infinity. You can ask, what's, what happens to the distribution of these random curves, the, uh, the, the, the contours? Do they converge to something in distribution? The answer is yes. Um, the set of random contours converges to an object which is a conformal loop ensemble with kappa equal to 3. Uh, yes. Yeah, at the critical. This is only true at the critical point. So here you do an easy model at the critical, at, for the critical beta. You look at the contours, take a scaling limit in distribution. This, the collection of such contours con, uh, converges to a conformal loop ensemble with kappa equals to 3. That means it's the same distribution as if you were starting in this domain uh, doing a Brownian loop soup with lambda equals a half. That is something you can check as homework. Kappa equals 3 corresponds to lambda equals a half. So if you start, a, if you do a Brownian loop soup with lambda equals a half, you do this loop soup percolation, you look at the boundaries of the, of the clusters, it has the same distribution as the scaling limit of, the, of these boundaries from the easing model. No particular reason why that should be the case, except that, in some sense, there's only a finite, uh, there's only, there are only so many conformal invariant objects. <laughs> uh, that's in some sense at the heart, I think, of universality in some vague sense. So, but that tells you that this Brownian loop soup is connected to, uh, in some sense, contains many of the geometric properties of the scaling <coughs> limits of many models of statistical mechanics that have been studied for decades. And that makes it quite an interesting model. Okay, so uh, let's see what else I wanted to say. Ah, so let me just very briefly, I have uh, seven minutes, how, how long? Six minutes. Um, so I just want to mention very briefly, so so far I've been talking about the scaling limit where the, the kx values were all equal to zero. So there was no killing. And that's, in some sense, the critical point of this random walk model, random walk loop soup. If you introduce killing, and you have conformal invariance. That's why, uh, so it's critical, so you get conformal invariance stuff, you get Brownian motion. What happens if you, if you do have, if the kx are not zero? You can, uh, so I'll go rather quickly here, but I just want to give you the idea. You can, so you can take a random walk loop soup with killing values, and I still want to want to take a scaling limit. The way I'm going to do it is actually I'm going to introduce some function which I will call a mass function for reasons that will be hopefully clear later, and I choose the k uh, according to this equation. It's not obvious why, but it works. There are reasons why I will not show you probably. So now I'm doing a random walk loop soup. The transition probabilities that I started, the, uh, used at the beginning are not, now not just the ones for simple symmetric random walk, but there is some killing involved. That tells you that large loops should be somehow penalized. And it turns out that I call this object a massive random walk loop soup. It converges to 
It does convert to a Brownian loop soup, but a, a different version of the Brownian loop soup. And the convergence is similar to the one uh, studied by Lawler and his former student. But what happens is, so it converges to an object that I call the massive Brownian loop soup. And now I just want to tell you what it is because it's very simple. Um, notice that what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm rescaling this function m, uh, which means, if you think about what that means, it means that the killing rates are going to zero, but at a very specific speed. Okay. And so for those who know what this means, it, this is like taking a near critical scaling limit. If I, let k, if, if, if I keep kx fixed, then I would get nothing because all the loops get killed. If I let kx go to zero too fast, then I'm back back to this situation of the, of the usual Brownian loop soup. You don't see the killing if it goes to zero too fast. But if you choose the, an appropriate rate, then you get something which looks like a Brownian loop soup in some sense, but it's different. And this is really what you see in statistical mechanics. You can do it for the easy model. You can change this measure, and you can add, for example, an external magnetic field. Okay. And if you take a scaling limit and you let h go to zero with a at an appropriate speed, you will get another interesting model which is not conformal invariant but is somehow related to the conformal invariant one. So this is what is called a near critical scaling limit. And in this case, it's very easy to describe. That's why I like it. Uh, what is this massive Brownian loop soup? Well. It's again a Poisson point process, like before. What changes is the intensity measure. And it changes in a, in a very simple way. So the, the, the massless or critical Brownian loop soup is a, is a Poisson point process with this as its intensity measure, this mu d. The massive version has an intensity measure which is absolutely continuous with the, with the Brownian loop measure. It's simply tilted in some sense, and you can e write explicitly by what? By you take the exponential of minus, uh, and you integrate over a path, over a loop gamma, you integrate this mass function squared. So if you take the mass function to be a constant, but this is the rescaled mass function. Okay. If you take it to be a constant, you see that what you have is simply exponential decay uh, of the loop. So the larger the loop, the more, the more likely it is to be killed in some sense. It's suppressed exponentially. M. Gamma is T sub gamma is the the time length of the loop of loop gamma. Yeah so okay let me let me uh, here this is this is how you have to think about that. Okay this is the def formal definition if you want. Uh, yeah, so these are loops of finite length. And you define a new measure which contains this term. There is a nice way to think about them. So what's the massive Brownian loop soup? It's the following thing. Take a realization of the critical Brownian loop soup. That means without mass, the object that I defined earlier. Okay, now you have a bunch of loops. Okay, to each one of the loops, you associate an uh, uh, exponential random variable independently for each loop. And then you do a thinning of your Poisson process. You decide, for each loop, you decide if you want to keep it or not. That corresponds to the tilting of the measure here. And that corresponds to a thinning of your Poisson process. You simply, this is very easy to check. For, for people who are familiar with these things, it should be almost immediate. But th this factor, what it does is, every loop, you, for every loop you compute this, if it's larger than this random variable, then you throw away your loop. So you make your soup thinner. So, uh, so then what you have immediately is that the new model you get at low scale, uh, at small scales, look very much like the, the previous one because you're not removing many of the small loops. But because you're tilting the measure, you cannot expect this measure to be conformally invariant anymore. And it will not be because you're, you're introducing an exponential killing for large loops. And this is 
something I call a mass because in fact 1 over m essentially tells you the length, the correlation length of your system. Up to length 1 over m your loops are quite safe but if they become larger than that because of this factor then they have a good chance of being uh, thrown out of the soup. So, uh, well, let me just jump to the, uh, yeah, so this, uh, th this thing is going to be my last slide for this part. I have 30 seconds. <laughs> so the, the massive Brownian loop soups is similar to the critical one at, at short scales. Um, it does not have conformal invariance. It has some other property, which I was planning to define, but I will not define. It essentially has, it is conformal invariant in some sense, provided that you rescale the correlation length locally. So when you do a conformal map, you, 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 find, you get a new system whose correlation length is uh, dilated locally by a factor which is, which is f prime of z. Okay, so it's essentially the same system where you, if you have a conformal map F, you have to see the local amount of rescaling, of, uh, the local amount of dilation, and that tells you how the correlation length changes locally, and that tells you how, how M changes locally. So when you do a conformal map, you'll have another massive Brownian loop soup, uh, which is, looks exactly like the, 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 the one you started with, but you have to adjust the M. And you adjust the M by divided by F prime, uh, F prime of, by the, the modulus of the derivative of, of the conformal map. But in this model, you can also sh show that if you, do th if you do the loop soup percolation, so you construct clusters, then you can ask how large are these clusters, you see that there is exponential decay. Not, so the exponential decay of the individual loops is obvious from the tilting of the measure, but now I'm doing percolation with these loops. So it's not obvious that the clusters decay exponentially. And this is not true in the critical case, but it is true for this massive case. So in this sort of very simple model that only uses random walk and Brownian motion, you see all of these features. You see a critical scaling limit, you see a near critical scaling limit, which is not conformally invariant anymore, has exponential decay of correlation, but it retains some of the conformal invariance in the form of conformal covariance. And uh, well, I'll stop here. <laughs>